What is up, you guys? Welcome to another edition of Controversial Thoughts on the week before Christmas, another holiday. So happy holidays to everyone, no matter what you're celebrating. I get a lot of questions about dairy, especially since we just released our grass-fed, grass-finished colostrum at Heart and Soil. And I wanted to talk about dairy in human health. As many of you know, there are definitely a lot of indigenous cultures, European cultures, and even sub-Saharan African cultures like the Maasai that include dairy in their diet and thrive with this. As I'm gonna talk about in this controversial thoughts, which I will try to keep as short as possible, um, there are many benefits to dairy and there are lots of studies that show inverse relations. Again, these are epidemiology studies, but there are lots of studies that show inverse relationships between dairy consumption and a variety of diseases. So there are a lot of cultures, there is an ancestral historical precedent to including dairy in our diets. But as we thought about including immunomilk in the heart and soil lineup, I had to think about that, the fact that for myself, I've never really been able to tolerate dairy. Now, not wanting to be selfish, I thought, I can't ignore the fact that there are many of the clients that I have worked with over the years who have told me fantastic stories of improvement in their gut health and overall immune health with the inclusion of colostrum in their diet. And so with that in mind, I did some research on colostrum and decided that it would be a very valuable addition to our lineup at heartandsoil.co. So our grass-fed, grass-finished colostrum is now live at heartandsoil.co if you wanna check it out after this video. Here's the deal with dairy. For myself and some other people, casein and whey, which are proteins in dairy, are immunogenic. And when I eat dairy, it triggers my eczema a little bit and I get a little bit of itchiness on my beard and my scalp. But there are a lot of people I know who do just fine with dairy. And I think this is simply the immunologic uniqueness of every human. And so if you are someone who does well with butter or ghee or dairy, immunomilk could be a very valuable thing for you. Colostrum could be a very valuable thing for you. Dairy in general could be a very valuable thing for you. And so I wanted to share my thoughts on this. So basically from the outset, the first decision point is, do you react to dairy? And now the first question is, do you react to cow's milk dairy, right? And so yes, I react to cow's milk dairy. So I've excluded that from my life. The next question is, do you react to goat's milk dairy or other types of dairy that are not cow's milk? And I have found personally that I react to those as well. So dairy is out for me, even ghee causes reactions for me. But if you are someone who can include cow's milk dairy in your life, there's a lot of good nutrients in there. And we're gonna talk about a lot of them, including calcium, IGF-1, which is insulin-like growth factor one, which is incredibly beneficial for wound healing, TGF, alpha, and beta, lots of them coming at the end of this video and mini podcast. If you react to cow's milk, you might be able to do goat's milk instead. And if you react to goat's milk, you might be able to do goat's milk ghee, which is another good fat. So understand that there's different people who might react to different types of dairy, but then including more foods in your diet and including more animal foods in your diet, I think is better than not. So I really hope that people will understand that my intention is to um, just offer wisdom or offer some knowledge is perhaps a better word for this that might help people select the most and least toxic plant foods. And we're going to have an infographic with that at hardensoil.co very soon. And the, the animal foods that may be more and less triggering for them. Clinically, I've noticed that some people react to eggs and some people react to dairy. But if you can tolerate eggs and dairy, these are very nutritious foods. And just like I'm a huge advocate for eating nose to tail and getting a, a large variety of animal foods in terms of eating organs, which we put in all of our desiccated organ supplements, I'm a huge advocate for eating dairy and eggs if you can tolerate them. So with that in mind, if you are someone that can tolerate dairy, this video is for you. If you're someone that can't tolerate dairy, then I would recommend that you get your calcium from bones in bone broth. And in the future at Heart and Soil, we're gonna be coming out with a, uh, a bone meal product from grass-fed, grass-finished bones. That's gonna be a very high quality bone meal, but it's much better than bone meal. So stay tuned for that. That's gonna have ground up bones, microcrystalline hydroxy appetite for those of you who wanna get calcium, but can't do dairy. For those of you who can do dairy, I'm incredibly jealous of you because cheese is delicious, yogurt is delicious, and colostrum is incredibly nutritious for humans, no doubt. So I just wanna share a couple of papers looking at dairy and cancer risk. This is a review from 2011. There are a few more 
recent reviews, but as you can see here, based on systemic review of the epidemiological literature, so this is epidemiology, this is observational, the World Cancer Research Fund, the American Institute for Cancer Research report concluded there was a probable inverse association between milk intake and colorectal cancer, meaning the more milk people drank, lower risk of colorectal cancer. As we know, no epidemiology can draw causal inference. This is just, this is just observational. There was a probable association between diets high in calcium and an increased risk of prostate cancer. I'll come back to that one in a moment. And limited evidence of an association between milk intake and a lower risk of bladder cancer. For other cancers, the evidence was mixed or lacking. Now, if you read the rest of this paper, what you'll find is that they say since 2007 report, several additional large cohort studies have been published, including two that show an inverse association between the intake of cultured dairy products, so fermented dairy, and bladder cancer. So that's interesting. And then if you look further on, there are certainly studies sh <coughs> showing that there is a inverse association between fermented dairy and prostate cancer. So the jury's out on prostate cancer. Other cancers, there's certainly a significant amount of evidence to suggest that there's an inverse association between dairy consumption and those types of cancers. There's a few other things that I want to share with you guys here. So this is all on the YouTube video or the video at Heart and Soil. If you guys are just listening to this on the podcast and you want to see these, this is a publication from 2018, and it is looking at fermented dairy foods and the intake of... Uh, intake and the risk of cancer. Again, this one found an inverse association. Yogurt consumption was significantly and de associated with a decreased risk of cancer in the overall comparison and in the cohort studies. In terms of subgroup analyses by cancer type, fermented dairy food intake was significantly, significantly decreased bladder cancer, colorectal cancer, esophageal cancer. And it says in stratified analyses, significantly decreased colorectal cancer, was found to be associated with cheese intake. Yogurt consumption was significantly associated with decreased bladder intake and colorectal cancer risk. So that, again, this is all associational data, but that's compelling, that's interesting, okay? Now we can go further and look at some of these other studies. Milk and dairy product consumption and prostate cancer mortality, an overview of systemic reviews and meta-analyses. And what they found, again, this is just systemic reviews and meta-analyses. These are all observational studies. They found that statistical heterogeneity generates uncertainty in the, reserve, in the observed results. In conclusion, although there are some data indicating that a higher consumption of dairy products could increase the risk of prostate cancer, the evidence is not consistent. So there's mixed data with regard to prostate cancer, pretty, pretty significant consistent data with regard to all of the other cancers. Now we can talk about why dairy might be associated with prostate cancer, but I think that in general, um, there's a pretty inverse relationship here in epidemiologic studies. Dairy products and intake of cancer risk, a meta-analysis of 11 population-based cohort epidemiology studies. Total dairy products intake have no significant imp impact on increased all cancer mortality risk, et cetera. So you can see here, dairy consumption in epidemiology studies looks to be pretty safe. And I'll just probably end it there and just say, ancestrally, we've used it. If you can tolerate casein and whey, there's a good amount of evidence that there may be some benefit there to dairy in terms of many of the cancers. If you have prostate cancer, maybe you'd wanna dig into the literature a little bit more and decide whether dairy was the right thing for you or not. If you had cancer in general, it might be a more nuanced discussion, but for healthy individuals, which is where we're gonna assume we are and where we're starting, I think there's a good amount of evidence to at least make dairy look pretty good. And there's a lot of ancestral and evolutionary evidence surrounding dairy as well. I wanna take an aside for a moment and talk about conjugated linoleic acid which is a fatty acid found in dairy, ex almost exclusively in dairy, uh, and also in ruminant animal fat. But I get this question a lot because I warn you all about linoleic acid and people say, well, this tallow or this meat that I'm eating says it has conjugated linoleic acid. Is this a problem? And I 
don't think it is because there's a very small amount of conjugated linoleic acid. It's, it's actually an isomer of linoleic acid. These two look different if you actually want to get into the actual molecular structures. Uh, linoleic acid looks like this. It's an 18 carbon polyunsaturated fatty acid, and it is technically named 18-2-cis-9-12, meaning it is a cis bond at the uh, 9 and 12 unsaturations. And if you go to conjugated linoleic acid, there are many isomers, but they have a, it has a trans bond, usually, usually uh, trans 10 cis 12 conjugated linoleic acid, meaning that the 10th or the 9th position in the molecule, uh, or the 10th or the 11th position in the molecule, excuse me, there is a, a trans positioning of the hydrogens around a double bond. But essentially, linoleic acid and conjugated linoleic acid are both 18 carbon, omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids. And I think the data here is quite mixed. There is a lot of very interesting, again, epidemiology associational data to suggest that conjugated linoleic acid is beneficial for outcomes in cancer, obesity, and atherosclerosis. Now, again, this is associational. This is epidemiology. And if you guys are interested in this paper, you can go through, you can look at all of the studies. Um, I'll just say that it's a lot of these are epidemiology and the interventional studies are mixed as I would expect them to be because I'm not convinced conjugated linoleic acid actually performs much differently than linoleic acid in the human body. And I don't think we should worry about it because it's a very small amount. Just wanna highlight there's a significant negative correlation between milk intake and the risk of breast or colon cancer in this study. Um, and the effect, uh, an effect that is coincident with elevated CLA levels in a particular group of Finnish women, which I suspect is more a marker of animal food consumption than a benefit of conjugated linoleic acid. Another study showed that subjects consuming four or more servings of dairy per day showed a reduced risk of colorectal cancer. Again, these are just epidemiology cohorts showing that dairy is often associated with better cancer outcomes rather than worse cancer outcomes. CLA supplementation is a very mixed bag. And like I said, I think you can see things like this happening, increased serum LP little a, increased serum CRP and IL-6. This isn't to say that you should not eat animal products or that you should worry about conjugated linoleic acid and animal products. This is me saying that I have a hypothesis that epidemiology studies that associate conjugated linoleic acid with benefit are potentially showing a signal for animal products rather than the conjugated linoleic acid. Again, this is the danger of epidemiology studies. We don't know if the signal is conjugated linoleic acid or is animal foods or what it is. But the alternative and very viable hypothesis is that epidemiology studies, which consistently associate either levels of CLA in the blood or intake of CLA containing foods like dairy with better outcomes could actually be giving us a signal for animal foods. And isn't that cool? Because there are a lot of epidemiology studies that suggest that animal foods could be associated with worse outcomes, likely associated with unhealthy user bias, as I've discussed in the past. Now, don't be confused by this next study, but I wanna show you guys an interventional study that shows that supplementation with conjugated linoleic acid caused isomer dependent oxidative stress and elevated C-reactive protein. This is one of the studies that was shown in the previous review paper. And the reason I point out this study is to highlight the fact that I don't think conjugated linoleic acid is going to perform much differently than uh, linoleic acid in humans. And as I've spoken about before, in some interventional trials, we can clearly see that supplementing with linoleic acid increases oxidative stress. Again, I wanna be very clear about this next point. I'm not saying that you should worry about the very small amount of conjugated linoleic acid in animal foods. It's there, it's okay, it's not going to hurt you. I would not take a conjugated linoleic acid supplement, just like I would not include seed oils, which are high in linoleic acid in my diet. And I would hypothesize that the signal connection between conjugated linoleic acid and better outcomes may just be connected with an intake of animal foods, which have CLA rather than the CLA itself. So that's controversial. That's what we do here. So don't take CLA supplements. That's not a good idea in my opinion. That's not evolutionarily consistent. Do eat animal foods, including dairy and colostrum if you are immunolo immunologically tolerant of those. And 
I want to talk to you guys about a very cool dairy product, which is the first milk from cows called colostrum. So if you guys have questions about the CLA thing or the linoleic acid thing, you can always email me, Dr. Paul, drpaul at heartandsoil.co. You can email me if you have questions about any of our supplements or how to construct an animal-based diet, but hopefully that all makes sense. So just so you guys know, our immunomilk is sourced from grass-fed, grass-finished cattle in New Zealand, and it's never going to result in the calf, the baby of the cow not getting enough colostrum. Mother cows make way more colostrum than the babies need. And all of their first milk is going to the babies, giving them enough. And then the extra is being collected by the farmers in New Zealand. And then we spray dry that into the colostrum powder, which is in our immunomilk capsules. So all the animals are cared for. So let's talk about colostrum a little bit and then I'll wrap this up. There is an amazing article here, Colostrum and its Benefits. And as they say, colostrum is a nutrient rich food it's full of immune growth tissue repair factors, significant quantities of complement components that act as natural antimicrobial agents and actively stimulate the maturation of an infant's immune system or an adult's immune system potentially. So this is an incredible paper. There's a lot of information here and I'll go through it briefly. You can see that in colostrum, there are a number of cellular components from the immune system, macrophages, polymorpho, uh, nuclear cells, uh, PMNs, lymphocytes, epithelial cells. And as they say here, the colostrum contains many more growth factors and antibodies than ordinary milk. A lot more IgG, which is an antibody, and over a hundred times more IgA um, than milk. It's really meant to be an immunoglobulin powerhouse for animals. I love the beginning of this article. They talk about this historical reference to John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath. This is, an, this is a book that I had to read in probably middle school and I hated it, but I miss all of that good um, literature now. But apparently in The Grapes of Wrath, a woman who was lactating because her newborn had died and she was recently pregnant and postpartum, saved a man dying of starvation by breastfeeding him. And so I love they start this with this because if a newborn, you know, infant is going to have a mother, whether it's a female human or a female cow that has colostrum. So in the Grapes of Wrath, you heard it here first, there was a man saved by colostrum in the beginning of that fictional book. Apparently it caused quite a stir at the time because that sounds like pretty, pretty spicy uh, narrative fiction. But anyway, lots of immunoglobulins in colostrum, tons. Breastfed infants have higher levels of serum IgA than bottle-fed infants, no surprise there, but um, we know that this serum uh, immunoglobulin A, so SIGA is uh, secretory IgA, excuse me. It has the ability to bind Clostridium difficile toxin. So lots of important things to this mucosally associated um, antibody, this immunoglobulin IgA. Now, lots of immunoglobulins in colostrum. It also has lactoferrin an iron binding protein with antibacterial and antiviral properties. Human milk contains large quantities of lactoferrin and transferrin. Uh, transferrin, both are effective binders of iron. This is a really important thing. It's been studied for its protective effects in both bacterial and viral infections. Moving on, bovine colostrum also has other immune factors, IgG we talked about. It's been studied uh, to protect people against shigella, which causes dysentery. Shigella, Flexneri, fun named bacteria that does not fun named things to you. Uh, it's very rare, but Shigella is real. And when people were given orally administered bovine immunoglobulin concentrate, it protected human volunteers from infected, uh, infection after they were injected with Shigella Flexneri. It also protected, um, I believe, in some H. pylori trials. This trial investigated the presence of natural antibacterial activity of H. pylori in the serum, colostrum, and milk from non-immunized cows. Results showed that serum and colostrum, but not post-colostrum milk, were highly bactericidal for H. pylori. So could taking colostrum benefit those with H. pylori? It certainly is a reasonable intervention and it's pretty darn safe. Moving on, the benefits, the incredible you know, power of colostrum doesn't stop there. You can apply colostrum to the eye of a neonate and it would protect them from a chlamydia, chlamydial infection in the eye. Chlamydia trachomatis causes 
chlamydia of the genitals, but it also causes ophthalmia neonatorum in infants if the mother has a chlamydial infection and the baby goes through the birth canal, it can get it in the eyes, can cause all sorts, of, all sorts of problems there. But topically applied colostrum was effective in the prophylaxis of ophthalmia neonatorum of chlamydial etiology. Another investigation revealed that topically applied colostrum alleviated severe dry eyes and problematic eye lesions. Now, if you were going to topically apply colostrum, you might wanna make a paste out of it somehow. We can investigate that at Heart and Soil. I've never done that, but you could certainly take our powder and put it into a little bit of oil. And I think it would be pretty safe to put on eyes. I haven't experimented with it. I could go down and explore this reference. People are curious. Colostrum and T-cell activation. This is discussing proline-rich peptides, PRPs. These endogenously in our body stimulate immature thymocytes to turn into functionally active T cells. You've all heard me talk about the thymus, which is in our histamine and immune supplement, high in vitamin C for an animal organ, in fact, high in vitamin C in general. And that's where your T cells mature. PRP is involved in that, proline rich peptides. So, again, this PRP is an immunoregulator and found in the colostrum. It's going to really affect our immune system, probably in a positive way in humans. So, Pretty incredible. Check this one out. Colostrum has about one half of the in vitro inhibitory activity of gentamicin against Staph aureus and other coliform organisms. These are bacteria, coliform bacteria. So again, this is in a test tube, but colostrum was half as effective as a very strong uh, antibiotic, which has a lot of bad side effects uh, called gentamicin against Staph aureus. That's cool. So moving down here, um, the IgG, the, event, the ingestion of IgG had neutralizing activity against several serotypes of rotavirus infection, which is a diarrheal infection, reduced the occurrence of diarrhea uh, and the duration of diarrhea and the duration of virus excretion in infants. Thus, bovine IgG and colostrum milk has the potential to be utilized as an immunological supplement in infant formula and other hyperimmune foods. This is not medical advice. I would not give colostrum to any babies without talking to your doctor first, but that's an interesting thing that they suggest in this paper. In vitro and in vivo models, so in the test tube and in the body, suggests that colostrum could be beneficial for reducing non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug-induced GI damage. So NSAIDs, these are Aleve, ibuprofen, things like Motrin, they can damage the gut lining by preventing the, formula, the formation of prostaglandins and other protective mucus, and in both in vitro and in vivo studies, colostrum was helpful for that. So that's fascinating. Again, the benefits just go on and on. Colostrum is helpful for wound healing. It contains TGF alpha and beta and IGF one and two. Now people worry about IGF one and two for cancer, but we talked about all of that in the beginning with regard to milk. As we age, many of us will lose our muscles and something with IGF uh, could be very beneficial for us as we're aging to maintain our muscle mass, which we know, as my friend Gabrielle Lyons says, is an organ of longevity. You need muscle mass. And I'm definitely going to recommend this immunomilk to my parents who are increasingly losing muscle mass in their 70s, a condition called sarcopenia. So having IGF-1 could be beneficial. And for even for young athletes, more IGF-1 is going to lead to more muscle development, probably improvements in recovery, tissue repair, all of these things. So this is a really big deal for athletes. And interestingly, I will pause there and share with you guys an aside, which I think is more entertaining than anything else. Because colostrum has IgG and because it is beneficial for wounds and muscle recovery and probably anabolic stimulus in general, colostrum is actually banned by the NCAA. It is an IGF-1 containing substance, colostrum, deer, antler velvet, and a synthetic peptide called MK677. Now, I wanna mention that uh, colostrum is totally safe for all other professional sports, Major League Baseball, football, basketball, no one else bans colostrum, but I think it's more of a compliment to colostrum that the NCAA says, wow, this is actually powerful enough that it could improve recovery, give athletes a competitive advantage or a strength advantage or a muscle building or a pair advantage, we should ban it. So we did a post about colostrum and hardened soil and we said it contains no banned substances, meaning with all of our substance, with all of our products, people ask me all the time, does it have anything that will cause me to uh, be positive on a drug testing screen. We work with a lot of professional athletes, 
pitchers for a variety of major league baseball teams take our supplements, uh, football players take our supplements, uh, all kinds of people take our supplements. I was hanging out with Matt Frazier over the weekend from CrossFit at Rome Ranch, and I gave him a bottle of our beef organs. And of course, uh, like so many others, he says, is there anything in here that could be illegal? And I said, no, there's nothing in there but organs. And so our organ supplements are completely, there's nothing in them. But it is interesting to note that if you are an NCAA athlete, you can't take colostrum. So you can't take our immunomilk, but everybody else can and will benefit greatly, including my parents, your parents, anybody looking for wound healing or muscle recovery. So I just thought that was pretty cool that and in some ways, let's just warn the NCAA athletes, you can't take this, but everybody else can. And it's clearly powerful stuff if the NCAA doesn't want people to have it. How interesting is that? Anyway, this paper goes on. Um, one of the uh, unpleasant side effects of aging is that muscles tend to waste away. Cholesterol IGF-1 promotes the buildup of lean muscle tissue and the burning of fat for energy. There's another one in here, which is really cool. The presence of hepatocyte growth factor in human milk and that HGF produced by macrophages increase the growth of intestinal cells. So the three things that people generally take colostrum for that I have seen benefit are improvement of gut issues and something like this, the HGF, the human growth, hepatocyte growth factor could improve the growth of intestinal cells. So I'm really interested in this for people who have underlying persistent gut issues. And that's the main thing I've heard in my clinical practice is that people with gut issues that didn't resolve, colostrum was often the spark that really turned things around in a good way. So that's important. And that's connected with hepatocyte growth factor. That is really cool. Um, whey proteins isolated from buffalo colostrum uh, improved the growth of bifidobacterium, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of cool things there with regard to colostrum in the article. Again, if you guys are curious about that, it'll be on the YouTube at Heart and Soil if you want to see the reference, or you can shoot me an email and I will send you the reference for that if you want to dive deep into the benefits of colostrum and the article. The last two things I will wrap up with with regard to sort of super milk, immunomilk and colostrum is that there are a couple of studies that have looked at the comparison of people taking colostrum, in this case, in connection with bifivir, which is a probiotic, with of all things, flu vaccination. And both of these studies found that either colostrum alone or colostrum plus vifivir were just as good, if not better, than flu vaccination. Well, how good is that? Now, again, no medical advice given here. I'm not recommending that you forego a flu vaccination or anything like that to uh, in favor of colostrum. But I mean, there are some studies here that suggest that this could be a reasonable thing to consider. It is your decision. Personally, you can talk to your own physician about the pros and cons of getting a flu vaccine versus not getting a flu vaccine. But there are a couple of groups in both of these trials that got both colostrum and a vaccination. And that was, that was a good outcome as well. So I think that there is, you could at least begin to suggest that in these two interventional studies, colostrum was as effective or more effective than a flu vaccination in preventing flu and probably has less side effects. In fact, I'm sure it has less side effects. So again, I keep coming back to my parents probably because it's relevant for COVID and it's the winter. And I think I really would like my parents to take immunomilk in addition to the flu vaccines that they will probably select to take when I respect their decision there. That's their decision. And they will probably take the COVID vaccination as well. And I've talked about that on previous podcasts. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. So this is the dairy controversial thoughts. Hopefully it's helpful. Again, go back to the beginning. If you don't tolerate dairy, get your calcium from bones. We're coming out with a bone product soon at Heart and Soil. Stay tuned for that. Or you can eat the bones after you make bones in a bone broth. If you do tolerate dairy, it's amazing. It's delicious. And the first milk, the colostrum, is really super milk. And that's why we called it immunomilk. It's full of all those good growth factors at the heartandsoil.co website. There's a list of all that stuff. Again, it's all in the video, which is at heartandsoil.co or YouTube if you want to find that stuff. But colostrum is a freaking powerhouse, you guys. And fermented mm -hmm. dairy and other types of dairy are delicious. So include dairy if you can. Get the most wide, the most variety full diet you can and, uh, but leave out the toxic plant foods. So hopefully that's helpful. Appreciate you guys. Again, like I said, I am so grateful to do this work. I think we are really changing lives. I hear stories from you every day. Keep sending your stories, people improving massively with all of our products. 
And I have so much good experience with colostrum in my clients that I had to include it. I wanted to offer it to you guys. So I can't wait for you guys to try it and let me know what you think. Stay radical. Love you all.